Hi, everybody. We're the Skeleton Crew. Happy New Year. This is going to be our first video of 2024, oh. I think. Ew, it is, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Ooh. New Year, same us. Uh, maybe new us. Worse us. Some of our cells have been <laughs> in place since last year, so to some degree, new us as well. Us of Theseus. Fewer us. We're missing a member. Fewer us, yes. I guess we could acknowledge now <laughs> instead of when we say <laughs> we're, we're the skeleton We're the crew. channel entirely. What'd you say? Yes. Um, <laughs> we were good to say this, but Alex has lost at sea. <laughs> um, he's not lost at sea he's lost at land right he's still in Puerto Rico I think he is either that or they got a new flight and he's on either it that or right he's now. lost over sea yes oh, he, he might be lost in air yeah over a sea <laughs> yes um, Alex there's apparently a dense layer of ethereal fog concealing the airport in New Haven Connecticut <laughs> only um, that is preventing Alex from taking a flight back from his family vacation. We're recording this during the holiday week. Um, so he's not able to join us today, which is unfortunate, but uh, we will persevere without him. And we'll we're going to talk about a fairly large Barely. sauropod dinosaur. Um, and how big it is, we'll discuss at some point in this video for probably a little bit too long. How big is it? <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Um, so before we get into talking about Dreadnoughtus today, uh, a brief introduction for anybody new joining us in the year 2024. Um, my name is Dr. James Napoli. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. My name is Amelia Zietlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. My name is Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. And my name is Dalton Meyer. I am a PhD candidate at Yale University. And together, together. We're, the we're the skeleton, skeleton crew. crew. Um, and as we noted before, Alex is not able to be with us today, but he's with us in spirit, and he will surely be with us in phylogenum, uh, which has been left in his will to Dalton. <laughs> yes. Uh, as his roommate. <laughs> but before we get into phylogenum, we should probably reveal the animal that we're talking about today. So Dalton, why don't you let it uh, let it free from its hatchery? Certainly. There's also now, no way it could fit into there. No. no so not even a little is, bit. Um, we are fortunate, perhaps unfortunate, in that this is the first dinosaur that we're tackling after the big update, in which movie skins have been treated as separate models now for a lot of these things. Dreadnoughtus is one of those. So we have oh, two things to release. this is the first one that we have for that. Um, yeah. So I'm going to start with the original Frontier model. And they, I believe they have different release animations, so we'll do them both. Maybe they don't. I was testing this out earlier. I know they definitely have different sounds, which is something I'm definitely going to bring. Ooh, I should turn on the sound on my stream then. I'm going to say, even though... Ooh, it might do it. Yeah. I like that sound. I, I it's I'll a good say... Sound. As these guys are releasing, the Frontier Dreadnoughtus has one of my favorite sounds for a sauropod. It's fantastic. It looks like a King of the Hill character, though. It does. <laughs> Why is the book like that? It's no right. Um, we'll say more I... about that later. It looks... Yeah. <sighs> <Yeah. sighs> <And> second. <laughs> second, yes. Here comes the new 2020 or 2019, 2021, 2022, 2022 Dreadnoughtus, Dominion, Dominion Dreadnoughtus, whenever that movie came out. See, boring. I like that boring too, sounds. honestly. It's just like a generic, like, like sauropod bellow. It's not like. It's not like a Warhammer horn, like when this thing That's opens fair. its mouth. I, hmm. But what's also good is that it can open its mouth, and its <laughs> face doesn't look like one of those deep-sea blobfish that's experienced catastrophic decompression as they've brought it to the surface. Which it's got, it's got <laughs> jowls like a, like a pug. It's great. It looks like Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Look at the stance on these two. Yeah, they're very, very they're, different. They're, God, yeah, they're so <laughs> different. That one's stanced up. <laughs> oh, it's turning. Okay, I thought he was doing like a oh, little shimmy do, there. I think they're going to do a social animation. Possibly. Oh, I, I'm interested to see these two things interact with one another. <laughs> that is that is something that me whenever I introduce two groups of friends. Um, <laughs> Um, that I is like something how much that, prep work there is for them to interact. Yeah. <laughs> like, hold on. It let me get like, to my mark. It's like when snails interact. Like, it's really <laughs> slow and, like, it looks like there's thought happening, but there's really not. Oh, that's sweet, though. Very nice. Lovely. So, Dreadnoughtus. What's uh, yeah. This dinosaur is known from, well, part, I would say that a good part of this thing's popularity comes down to the fact that this name goes so hard. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, full genus and species name is Dreadnoughtus uh, shrani, um, where the word Dreadnoughtus is the same um, etymology as the battleship Dreadnought, which weirdly for uh, us on the Skeleton Crew is one of the first, if not one of the only names that's going to be on here that is, I guess, more or less English derived. Um, from Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. Dread meaning fear, not nothing. Um, and uh, Scranny... Or, or, or Shranny, sorry, um, is from the American entrepreneur uh, Adam Shran, who helped finance the work on this guy. Um, but one fun fact that I do want to say around the etymology of Dreadnought is that Admiral Fisher uh, of the Royal Navy actually adopted... I, I, I've seen a couple sources that kind of go back and forth of whether the name for uh, the Dreadnought class of battleships was taken from his personal motto, or whether he adopted a personal motto in reference to the Dreadnoughts. But either way, he had a personal motto that went hard as hell, that was Fear God and Dreadnought, which uh, at least I think is half true for this thing. I do not think it dreaded much, but I also don't think it feared God. <laughs> because this thing was a god. This thing is a deity in corporeal form. And it is like an unreasonably, ridiculously large animal. That, By which like, you mean it's a reasonably, it's like a mid-sized titanosaur. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a good-sized titanosaur. But like even... even it's not like, a mid-sized sedan, though. It's not no, a mid-sized no. sedan. Um, it, it is not, it, nor is it on a beach that makes you old, or a desert that makes you old, depending on the episode of Prehistoric Planet you're on. <laughs> um, but uh, it is an incredibly, <laughs> incredibly cool name. It is an amazing name. So I've mentioned, uh, and I've sniped Scott's point a little bit, that Dreadnoughtus is, in terms of linear dimensions, not extraordinarily large for a titanosaur. Um... We're going to get into how big it is in a biological mass sense, but um, it's something that I kind of noticed, because Dreadnoughtus was one of the first big fossil discoveries that happened when I was in college, when I was like trying to pay attention to the literature like a little bit. Yeah, so this thing remember, was like, described was in 2014. Published. It was recent. Right. Right. And so I was like, depending on when in 2014 it was published, I was either a freshman or a sophomore. So, you know, this is like Pretty a sure lot of my friends were I think like, it was June. Yeah, so I might have... Uh, no, in that case, it would have been a freshman. A rising sophomore. Oh, rising. A rising sophomore, there. yeah. So what I'm saying is I remember it coming out, and I remember the, like, wave of paleo art of Dreadnoughtus, and I feel like everybody made it just physically the largest thing in the landscape, like, in terms of its length and height. And I think the, in, the incredible thing about Dreadnoughtus, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, is or maybe we'll talk about it right now, is the si the mass of the animal. Mm -hmm. In awe of the size of the lad. Bring him back an right. incredibly absolute old unit. meme. That, listen, I say absolute unit a lot still. So so Patagotitan, which is this titanosaur that's famously on display at the AMH, it was actually installed at the AMH before the um, 
the scientific name was published. And so it's in Chicago as it, well. It's it's named nicknamed Maximo there. Right, right. There's it's Maximo and is it in it's somewhere else too, right? It's a, there's a temporary exhibit of it in London currently. I don't know how long okay. it's going to be there and where it's going to travel uh, from there, but I believe that the the NHM UK designed that exhibit, so it started. Well, it's there. about 120 feet long. <laughs> that's how long it, it's. It, that's a terrible pun. <laughs> I'm moving right along. Kill me. Um, yeah, please. I think Patagon Titan is in terms of linear dimensions bigger. Like if you've been to the AM and H, but before you, the Titanosaur was there, you should go back. But also, you would have seen like the Apatosaurus, the Barosaurus, and the Rotunda that's rearing up. Patagon Titan is so much bigger. It actually makes those animals look reasonable. And those yeah. were some of the largest dinosaurs ever known at the time they were discovered. Um, now, there is like rumor of an exceptionally large specimen of Barosaurus based on like one vertebra. Yeah. I'm excited to see that published, but it's not published yet. We so. love more sauropods of exceptional size based on a description of a single <laughs> vertebra. If I right. had a nickel, well, I'd not, have even, two nickels. not even a description yet. It's like I, it, I've seen it only talked about in like blog posts. And, okay, when, when I say so description, I don't mean in the scientific sense. I, I mean see. someone described it, like just <laughs> talked about it. Right. Right, that's fair. Not, um, not in the biblical sense. <laughs> right. Have <laughs> you described this animal biblically? I descri- <laughs> if it's a titanosaur, every description is a biblical description because they're very <laughs> big animals. All I'm trying to say is that I think that it, it, is, it is A, worth noting how big the largest titanosaurs are, but B, that I think in terms of like linear dimensions, the length and the height, I think Patagotitan is actually quite a bit larger than Dreadnoughtus. Dreadnoughtus seems to have been a much more massive animal. And that was what the name is, I think, really referencing. And I believe was the crux of the paper, right? Yes. Was that it was like perhaps the heaviest terrestrial vertebrate ever discovered. I also want to chime in here really quick that like... I, James makes an incredible point of that Patagotitan is like absurdly huge, and I've heard from a lot of um, friends who've seen Maximo at, at the Field Museum because I unfortunately have not been there since Maximo has been there. Um, that it's even more so with Maximo in the rotunda where it's standing up at its full height and everything. But um, one of the things that is a little bit of a hard pill to swallow for um, the Patagotitan at the AM and H. I remember having this chat with um, uh, James and my biological mother. Nice. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Chop. Um, that the Patagotitan at the AM and H is in what is most likely an almost like physiologically impossible position <laughs> for it to be in. Uh, in that it is basically doing a wall sit. It, it's crouched. Uh, because it's physically too large to fit in on the whole floor. Mm -hmm. Like, the vertebrae are almost touching the ceiling, and if you look, every single one of its legs is bent, because it needs to be, like, leaning down to get in there. And, like, also, in addition, like, its neck reaches into one hall, its tail is in the other. It's an absurd creature. Yeah, and it's, mm-hmm. I think it's a really cool way to mount it, too, to have its it head, is. like, poking out the door into a different room. Like, what else are you going to do? It's too big. Mm-hmm. Have, having um, seen all three incarnations of the the, tit- of the Patagotitan cast, I actually think the London exhibit is maybe the best for displaying its scale. I love the mm-hmm. American Museum because it's in three different rooms. And, like, that in and of itself is like, oh, wow, this animal's huge. And you can get pretty close to it. You can get a little closer at the Field Museum, and it's fully standing up. That's impressive, but the issue is just that the room it's in is so, so big that it kind of obliterates, like, the scale of the animal, especially because it's just a skeleton. So, like, when you can yeah. see through it, it's hard to appreciate how big it is. The room that it's in in London is, like, just the right size, where it's not cramped. The animal is, is pretty erect. It's not as, like, majestic as the Field Museum. Um, but you can walk right underneath it. It's right on the ground. It, um, I think, is probably doing the best job for the scale. So hopefully when that exhibit travels, it's put into equivalent size spaces, although I'm sure it's going to depend on what institution it goes to. 
Yeah, I think yeah. you can walk under it at the Field Museum as well. Yeah. And I went to see it because I used to live in that area um, when it very close to whenever it first opened. I was like, oh, that sounds fun. And yeah, like part of it, well, I guess having been to the Field Museum before and after um, the room that it's in, it's the main, you know, the main hall when you when you come in is really big, but it still takes up like half of it, which is insane. And especially having been in there before when it was like when it was just Sue, because Sue was nothing compared to that thing. And the way they have it mounted there as well, that is a, a kind of fun, is they have it because its neck is up. It's actually at the level of the second level of the museum, which is fun. So there's a little corner on the second floor where you can go just like look at its head lifted off the ground. Um, and I think at the same time, the sa as, at the same time as when they unveiled that was when they unveiled the new uh, pterosaur models. So they have one standing cats and one flying cats mm -hmm. and the standing cats gets me every time talking about animals that are bigger than you expect them to be insane giraffe yeah. bird horrible animal but um i was at the field museum cool. recently um and i like i think it's big in the space but it's something I, I like i do kind of agree with scott i think the sheer scale of that hall like is kind of not great for any of the natural history artifact like objects that it displays just because like oh that was dalton's point so not me. Big. what that was dalton's point oh. not mine <laughs> oh i'm sorry i thought there was i thought you had said it too i'm sorry um or that you would said it instead but then i agree with dalton um it i don't know like i mean i think it's such a large animal it still does look big there but it's like the you know these buildings in Chicago were like built on a scale that I think exceeds what most other museums would even deem like necessary. Like the Field Museum really emphasizes this central corridor space in this great hall, and they've used that space to a lot of really good um, effect as well. Like there's been a lot of traveling like art exhibits that are suspended from the ceiling. Um, obviously it's a wonderful space anytime they get a significant new specimen they can just put it there on display like that's what happened with Sue like they didn't need to renovate their fossil exhibit space to have Sue they could just bring that in mm -hmm. and I think that that's a wonderful thing for the museum to have it is just so big though yeah like two stories like it's like as wide as a city street I do think it, it robs it of the impact a little bit I think it was much worse for Sue because when I first it went was. and I saw Sue I was like, this is the biggest T-Rex ever? This doesn't look that big at all. <laughs> and now in the new room, I remember walking in when I was there a few weeks ago, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> this yeah, is I, really big. I've had a ton of friends yeah. who've gone to see Sue and just been like, that's it? I'm like, yeah. When it's like right, that... Well, I mean, the way, the way that everybody had hyped it up, it was like it was as big as Godzilla, and it's like, it's a big T-Rex. No, that's Scotty. Scotty's as big as God. No. <laughs> no. And we're not talking about Cope Rex here. The, it's a privately owned specimen. We can't ever study it. And it's a femur. No, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to say that Scotty was bigger because I'm partial to that. I wonder why. Well, it's not, I thought that's another one where, like, the animal we're talking about here was more massive but not longer or not. <laughs> I just Scott. wanted to say that Scotty was big. That's all I, I wanted know, to say. I'm not I, making a point. No, but I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up on Amelia's point. I based <laughs> on my recollection without any data open in front of me, they're like neck and neck. And I think some linear elements might be like some linear measurements might be a little bit bigger on Scotty than they are on Sue. But I think it's just that Scotty's estimated mass is higher. Same. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> speaking of estimated mass. Yes. Speaking of Scotty's estimated What about Dreadnoughtus? <laughs> and not well, Attack Titan. <laughs> right. Well, that's the crux of the issue, isn't it? So, How you know, big I is think, it? Yeah. And I know, I think Dalton has gone on record as saying this a couple of times, like, you know, and to paraphrase your own point, Dalton, right, you consider size to be, like, like or height. I do. I, because we perceive the world in linear dimensions. And so when right. I consider how big is something, I'm like, what's its height, width, and depth? I don't care about its mass because I'm not going to try and lift it up. I right. understand a, the biological importance of mass, though. Right. As a biologist, when I ask, when somebody's like, oh, I've got a couch you could take, and I ask how big is it, I mean how heavy is it. <laughs> and that's the only... Wh when we talk about biological... Um, or So, in biology, when you talk about size, the most important thing is mass. 
it's it's the size of the animal is how heavy it is. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is that animals generally have similar density, so if you make the linear dimensions bigger, you are changing the mass. Mm -hmm. Like, there are clade-to-clade -clade differences with this. Birds are less dense than reptiles and mammals because they have such a pervasive system of air sacs, which is getting to something we'll talk about later on as well. Um, but generally speaking, right, like, animals all tend to be about the same density. We're a little bit less dense than water. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because our tissue is, you know, mostly water. So we're going to approximate water's density. And then we have lungs, which are airspace. So we tend to be a little bit less dense, which is why, like, if you go into water, you probably tend to float a little bit or like, you know, people don't sink like rocks if there's air in their lungs. Unless you're like, I think this happened to my sister once when we were kids where like they had to pull her out of the pool because she just jumped in. <laughs> and just plummet it oh. um, Because children can manage to do things that should be physically impossible, like a neutrally buoyant animal, just You're, like a torpedo. According to all lo known laws of buoyancy, a child should be able to float. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so Dreadnoughtus's description um, made a point of how heavy this animal is. And the estimated mass for Dreadnoughtus was like at approximately the, the mass of like a 747 big we're talking like 50 tons that's a very large animal yeah um this got to be a little bit of a debate and the that's reason okay. that i mentioned this is that i think it's probably helpful for the audience who may not know about this to know that estimating the mass of an extinct animal is not easy and there are multiple methods for doing it um and this is something I actually had to do quite a bit because um, when I was, and I've talked about this before, I think at the Deinonychus episode, when I was in college, I took a graduate seminar uh, that was being taught by a member of the department, mostly for grad students, but they let me take it because I was really interested, where we modeled the physiology of an extinct animal. And I did the Harvard Deinonychus specimen specifically because you had to base it on like an individual's mass and go mm. from there. And so I, we don't, looked I at, don't know the story, and I'm really curious to hear what you got for this. Well, I mean, I can go through all my old PowerPoints at some point if I find them, but... Genuinely um, pleased, you know, but not when we're recording. <laughs> right. Yes, this should have been the Deinonychus episode. Instead of ragging on the design, I should have been like, well, my estimate of the stroke volume of the heart of Deinonychus was this, and it probably breathed eight times per minute on average, which that is something I remember. I got a very low respiratory rate. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I think it's still higher than Henry proper. Kissinger at the time when we recorded that episode. Of <laughs> that's true. That's a good point. I think it, this is all very imprecise estimate stuff. It's very like order of magnitude level. But you start with mass estimation. And so the first way we ever estimated dinosaur masses on a in a rigorous way beyond just being like, yeah, you know, this much, um, which was the practice for longer in paleontological history than I think anybody likes to admit, where they'd just be like, yeah, it was probably probably about a ton. Um, is that you would take a dinosaur toy and submerge it in water and measure the volume displacement of the water after you've submerged the toy and then multiply that volume displaced by the estimated density of the tissue and then multiply that, you know, these values by the appropriate scaling factor to make it, for, you know, to get it from the size of the toy to the size of the real animal. Um... Sometimes paleontologists would actually make their own models for this. Sometimes they would just buy commercially available toys. Um, is it a terrible way to do it? Not as much as you might think, because a lot of the toys are pretty reasonable anatomically. And like, it's not, it's certainly not how I would choose to do it right now, but it, it was a way to do it when you didn't have access to a lot of other stuff. Um, this was done by uh, the like legendary paleobiologist R. McNeil Alexander, who basically invented the idea of studying locomotion. Um, For he, extinct he animals or in general? The idea of studying locomotion, or or for the mass estimation, you mean? No, no. The I was this the fir are you saying that this man was the first person to ever have the idea of let's study how animals move? I mean, in a rigorous quantitative way, yes, pretty much. That's was, super I, cool. Yeah, no, he was like, I mean, his work, when I was in the functional morphology community, like, 
R. McNeil Alexander was always where you went to to look for these kinds of principles. He codified a lot of terms about how we classify animal gates, how we model locomotion and the energy cost of locomotion. Um, I've read a bunch of his papers. I, there was a time in my life I really wanted to be a functional morphologist, and so it, his legacy really looms large in that field. He passed away a few years ago, but SVP in Berlin, which was my first SVP, did have a, uh, a symposium dedicated to him while he was still alive. Huh? So he was able to zoom in and watch it, and everybody presented their, you know, their work on locomotion that is benefited by decades more technological progress. But he was doing this stuff in like the 60s and 70s. There are now kind of two competing ways to do mass estimates that are a little bit more rigorous. One of them is referred to as graphic double integration, which is essentially that you look at, you take skeletal drawings of the animal in orthogonal views generally a lateral view and a top view. And you measure the dorsoventral length of a body segment and the mediolateral length of that segment. Um, and sometimes you'll have a front view too, so you get like three measurements, but usually you only get, um, usually you only take two. And you model the animal's cross-section at that level as an ellipse, and you multiply it by some value, which is the interval at which you're taking transects. So you might say, we're going to break the animal down into 100 slices. And so if the animal is, let's say, 10 meters long, that means that each, each slice is 10 centimeters wide. And you take the dorsoventral height and the mediolateral height for that segment, and you model that as an ellipse, and then you multiply that by the depth to get a volume, and you do that for all of the segments, and that gives you the volume of the whole animal. I did this for Deinonychus. Um, for my class on this mass estimation stuff. The thing that I don't love about graphic double integration is that you have a lot of uncertainty in terms of where you put the air spaces and how much of the body's density you assume is uh, like negated by air. For Deinonychus, this is something that can matter a lot, right? Like how much air sac volume are you estimating, right? How large are the lungs? Where are the air sacs positioned? What's their volume? Um, in animals that aren't pneumatic, I don't think it's a bad way to do it, but it is very labor-intensive. There is also a wonderful data-driven way to do this, which is, and this is very complicated, so bear with me. You measure the circumference of the bones that bear weight, and you plug them into a formula that tells you how heavy the animal was if its bones were that thick. I know I may have lost you there, so let me let me help you. You collect one or two measurements, and you plug them into a linear formula, and it tells you how big the animal was. It's basically now, like a, it, at least as far as I've given um, analogies of this to friends, is that it's like if all we had left of a house was the support beams, and you just like estimate how, like you find out how big of like how much weight a couple of those support beams could hold and you're like the animal was that big right y equals mx and i cannot emphasize this enough plus b and that's really all you really need to know um now i'm being very facetious about how simple this method is because Ooh, i think never. it's a wonderful example of something that is being like it's something that is elegant and data-driven. Like, it's less work overall, but it seems to actually be the most robust thing. This has been ground truth, to, and these formulas have been calibrated by measurements that have been, I think, collected a lot by um, Nick Campione, I think, for his PhD, and now he's continued over, like, years and years of time, where he's related the circumference of the femur and the humerus, which are the single elements in each limb that bear weight, and their relationship with the mass of an animal, where we actually know how heavy the animal was in life because it was measured, and then we have their circumferences of these elements. And surprise, surprise, those bones have a very consistent relationship with the mass of the animal because they have to, because they have to support the animal's mass. That is, I think, the gold standard for how we do mass estimations now because it's backed up by the most data. And those approaches are what tell us that Dreadnoughtus was about 54 tons somewhere like really really heavy the debate started because other people applied these volumetric methods like graphic double integration to dreadnoughtus and started saying that it was much lighter 
I don't see any reason that the animal would have had such overly thick limb bones if it were not actually as heavy as those bones indicate that it was. Like, they're not pathological. Like, yeah, if they had, like, you know, osteosarcomas on them or something, like big bone tumors that were changing the circumference, that would change it. But, like, there's no sign of pathology here. There's no reason for the animal to be that, uh, to have bones that can support that much weight if they're not actually that heavy. Maybe that doesn't seem to be how it was operate. And it was supporting. Well, I'm being dumb. I'm think? being dumb. I was like, maybe it was running a lot and it needed to support the massive impact of running at top speed. It- <laughs> it's just galloping. Um, anyway, that's my little spiel on these mass estimation methods. I'm inclined to trust the uh, the estimates based on the limb circumference or the limb bone circumferences. Um, that seems to be the best way we can do it, and it's been reinforced by like every available shred of data from modern animals. So I do trust it. I think that the issue with other methods is that there are more assumptions and judgment calls you need to make. And while you might be making them correctly, that factor alone just adds a lot more uncertainty and it's harder to come up with a reliable estimate. I have a question. Yeah, sure. What if they were too big to walk? What I mean by this is oh, I'm no. assuming these calculations don't hold up if they're aquatic because they're not bearing weight. In the yes. Case. Okay, yeah, that's, so they, all, that's, they, that's all it was. I, I understand yeah. that these were not aquatic animals. I just made the association. And Gotta make to the meme. Be the meme right. about it, yeah. Right. No, I should I should have emphasized these are for terrestrial animals. Right. Yeah. How much weight was the forelimb of a blue whale supporting? Right. Um, but it, it seems to it seems to work. And I will say that it does seem that the debate in like our community has settled on the original estimates being at least more accurate, mm-hmm. which is nice. Which which so, I guess. Cool. Correct me if I'm wrong, that would kind of to kind of tip the hat to one of the reasons why Dreadnoughtus has uh, one of the reasons Dreadnoughtus has such a claim to fame that like I guess most, if not all titanosaurs that have been measured or discovered since have kind of been compared to Dreadnoughtus. I think so. Yeah, because like, it's it's one of those things of like there's a little bit of a running joke of like every titanosaur that is discovered that is not an obviously very small one is labeled as the new biggest dinosaur. Um, and Dreadnoughtus has the distinction of being like with like a very long title that is uh, not qualifier filled but like stipulation filled of like the largest dinosaur that we have accurate es- uh, that we have like accurate and widely agreed upon measurements of its body mass right although i will say i'm now looking up stuff about patagotitan patagotitan is estimated as being almost as big or or maybe even a little bit heavier but we don't have that much of patagotitan skeleton we do have the forelimb and the hindlimb, though, which actually, is what we need. We've got a surprising but, amount of Patagotitan, but it's multiple but individuals. That's the thing. Multiple individuals. Mm, it's not, a, it's not a, because Dreadnoughtus is two, if memory serves. Yeah, it is. There's a, a big one and a small one, mm-hmm. which both are mind-blowingly huge. And I have heard some people, or at least some references, that even the big one has some signs that it wasn't done growing. No, so that was... Yes. I was it, going to say that, the, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Dylan. I was just going to say that, yeah, another claim to fame is that Dreadnoughtus is so massive, we estimate it's, it's humongous, and neither individual is done growing. Like, neither one um, has fused the scapula coracoid. Um, I think more importantly, neither one observes what we, see, we call an external fundamental system. So when you do bone histology, and you might be familiar with this, viewers, um, if you cut into a bone, um, you can get a gross estimate of the age of an animal, um, because every year, depending on seasonal variables of nutrient availability, growth will vary depending on kind of the lush season and the more scarce season. And lines will be deposited in the bones that record the variance in this growth when things are growing, when there's abundant resources and growth slows down when there's not. Um, you can use those to get a gross estimate of the age of the animal, kind of like using tree rings is, is the analogy that's used. And it's a good analogy. Um, but when an animal achieves essentially its maximum size when it's when it's reached its full size 
the lines aren't appreciably d- different from one another. So it's not like growing a ton of circumference every year. And you get all these tiny little stacked lines at the rim of the bone. And we call that an external fundamental system or an EFS. And that's treated kind of as the gold standard in histology of this is an animal that's reached its adult size. And we uh, do not see that in Dreadnoughtus. Now there is a, a vast amount of literature that I'm not tremendously familiar with describing the bone histology in sauropods, which is I think a little funky compared to other things just because their bones are so huge and they have to bear weight. But there are known specimens of pretty decent sized sau- sauropods like Apatosaurus for which an external fundamental system has been observed. So it's something that you would still probably expect to see in a fully grown titanosaur like Dreadnoughtus, and we just don't see it. Um, but I also don't know how what, how much that's been looked into for other big titanosaurs. Like, I don't know if anyone's done histology on Patagotitan. I don't think anyone's done it on Argentinosaurus, because I think there's one femur that I, I understand not wanting to cut up the one uh, and do histology on, so it's... And it's, I don't think you could fit it in a CT scan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you can observe these lines with um, with CT or uh, syn- synchrotron scanning, but obviously sauropods are too big for that. Um, so it's, it's unclear. It's possible that none of the titanosaurs that we found are are fully grown, but it's certainly well supported for Dreadnoughtus that it isn't. How much more growing um, it had to do? I don't know. They have done histological sections on Patagotitan. Oh, okay. Um, and apparently the individuals that are known did, were not fully grown either. Although I think they were, it sounds like they were close. But I think that it's just worth noting for our readers that there's a lot of kind of vagueness in the term like young adult or sub-adult that gets thrown around. And like that can mean a lot of things depending on who's saying it. Animals slow down their growth for a while before they stop it. And so it's often possible from a histological section to say like, okay, we know this thing was approaching adult size, but it's not quite there. Right. As Dalton said, we know that the animal was somatically mature, like it was no longer growing when it has an EFS. And that's really the only way to know. But, you know, having these young adults... I guess what I'm saying is it's not what I don't want any viewer of the skeleton crew to come away from this video saying, especially if you say it on social media, is none of these huge titanosaurs were fully grown. We have no idea how big they could have gotten. They probably could have gotten about this big. It's not like they're babies. (laughs) They're not babies, right. They're like, you know, I don't know if you were ever... Uh, Statistically, many of our viewers were teenage boys at one point or are right now. Statistically, a lot of them. And at one point, (laughs) yeah, at one point, you may have been... 17 and when you were 17 you might have been almost as tall as you are now but still growing a little bit that's kind of the analogy here the thing is with with um with dreadnoughtus and i'm going to try to access the paper it does sound like both individuals are like not really showing a huge slowdown in growth either so it is possible they got absolutely huge but again these aren't like hatchlings or something they're they're quite large and they're they're probably fairly old. Well, I'm going to try to open the paper right now. Wish me luck, everyone. Well, while James is doing that, do we want to talk about the fact that this is the first titanosaur that we've featured in this series? The first of two, I think. Yes, the first of two. Um, it is. Uh, it is, and I will take that over as I inherit from Alex the phylogenum time. And I'm gonna I'm gonna find a different individual to look at while I go into a not tremendous amount of detail because we can also discuss this with Alamosaurus. Spoiler alert: the other Titanosaur in the game. But obviously, we're looking at a sauropod. We've looked at several sauropods already, um, and we are looking at a Neosauropod as well. Um, we're on within Neosauropoda. We're in Macronaria. So the kind of two big groups of, of Neosauropods are your Diplodocoids and your Macronarians. We've talked about a couple diplodocoids already. We've talked about Diplodocus. Have we talked about Apatosaurus? Yeah, yes, we, yeah did. we did. Uh, mm-hmm. Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Camarasaurus, um, Brachiosaurus. Amargosaurus, Brachiosaurus. Yeah. So this is the second macro, third macronarian. Yeah. So the third macronarian alongside uh, Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus, and um, even within Macronaria, uh, a bit closer to. Brachiosaurus. Uh, oh, Nesiosaurus. Sorry, forgot about. 
forgot right. about that guy. Um, within Macronaria, as Scott mentioned, we've looked at Chimarasaurus and Brachiosaurus already. Chimarasaurus is kind of part of this first group of Macronarians, or one of the early groups of Macronarians. Um, and then we move on to a group called Titanosauriforms, which includes Brachiosaurs and kind of what we traditionally consider Titanosaurs. So those are part of Titanosauriformes. And then you have Brachiosauridae on one side of that, and this group called Somphospondyli on the other side. So this is a Somphospondylin sauropod, um, and that's a clade essentially that restricts things that are more closely related to Saltosaurus than to Brachiosaurus. Um, and within this, we at least provisionally have things like Sauroposeidon, um, and then the kind of classical titanosaurs, as well as a number of other dinosaurs that most people probably have never heard of, including myself. Um, if we go further within Sanfospondyli, we have Titanosauria, and that is the group that Dreadnoughtus is a part of. And that's the group that contains all of the famous titanosaurs like Argentinosaurus, um, Saltosaurus, uh, Alamosaurus for Jurassic swine, of course, um, and just a number of other Cretaceous sauropods, all part of this Titanosaur group. Um, the exact position of Dreadnoughtus, I wouldn't say is debated. I would say there is some, there isn't even contention, but people are a little iffy. There have been a couple of phylogenetic analyses that have included it, including the original description of Dreadnoughtus, as well as um, the description of Patagotitan also included Dreadnoughtus. And in both of those analyses, it is found as the sister or a very close sister relative of a clade called Lithostrotia. Uh, Lithostrotia includes some pretty famous titanosaurs like Saltosaurus. Uh, if you've seen uh, Prehistoric P Planet, it's got Ra Repetosaurus and Isisaurus. Uh, the inf infamously hard to say Opistocelacodia is a Lithostrotian. Um, well done. The na that name derives from lithos being stone, that these things, a lot of lithostrotians have osteoderms. Um, not all of them. It's not a defining feature of the group. And I, I God, believe I they were going in a much dumber direction. <laughs> that they were found I in the rock. Going up, they're found in rock. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and so, you know, this being just outside of that, you could maybe consider putting some osteoderms on it if you want, or like most depictions of it don't have it. I think that's very reasonable as well. Um, but that seems to be kind of widely distributed amongst the group. But it seems that that, um, that Dreadnoughtus is probably more closely related to Lithostrotians than to other titanosaurs, but probably isn't inside of Lithostrotia itself. The caveat being that in the paper that describes the actual postcranial anatomy of Dreadnoughtus, they're like, hey, it actually shares several features with um, some titanosaurs that at the time I believe were considered Lithostrotians, which include like Aeolosaurus, um, if it is in fact closely related to Aeolosaurus, and then you take the Patagotitan tree as gospel, then it's no longer very closely related to Lithostrotia and is instead more closely related to Patagotitan and Argentinosaurus. Um, that's more of a notion than anything that's supported by any actual analysis. So if you, if you want to go by what's been analyzed, and I suggest doing so, that's the, the most sound thing to do. We, we can consider Patagotitan to be just outside of this Lithostrotian clade, um, which is interesting because it's found in Patagonia, but it's not part of this clade that contains a lot of the other Argentinian uh, titanosaurs like Patagotitan and Argentinosaurus. Um, and so if that's true, it's, it's kind of showing a separate radiation or at least a separate group of titanosaurs inhabiting the same area at roughly the same time, which is pretty cool. Uh, there is a, a caveat though <laughs> that I will bring up, which is in 2022, uh, Carba, Carbido or Carbolido. I'm not sure how to say that name. So I apologize. Uh, and colleagues published a paper, which is a critical reappraisal, reappraisal of Titanosauria. Um, and they are kind of, iffy on even defining and keeping Lithostrotia as a name, because it seems that the membership of Lithostrotia varies a lot between different analyses. Um, and if you, if you consider uh, their kind of recommendation for, for Titanosaur phylogeny, then 
it's unclear where Pataka Titan would be because I don't believe they include it in their uh, their examples. So it's a titanosaur. Yeah, it sure is. Before we move on, I did a little. I was able to access the paper um, on Dreadnoughtus because the paper is open access, so I didn't have to do very much. Oh, I just clicked on the link, which is very helpful. Um, and it's worth noting that there are no lines of arrested growth or growth rings on the Dreadnoughtus specimen at all. Jesus. Now, what if you were going to take me out of context and embarrass me in front of my professional community, you'd say, Dr. Napoli of the skeleton crew said that it was a hatchling, which is one way to interpret it not having growth marks. Um, it apparently has been suggested that lack of growth marks and this extensive presence of... Um, like fibro, uh, vascularized fibrolamellar bone could be just a trait of titanosaurs because it's common. Like It's apparently common for titanosaurs to lack growth marks entirely, which might just indicate that the bone is being so heavily remodeled as they grow that you're losing growth lines and never really generate them. Just like off the top of my head, I could kind of, and, and cut me if my spitballing is biologically brain dead here but like i wouldn't be that surprised if that is the case because like with an animal this big you need to be eating so much food and digesting so constantly i'm not sure how much of a difference in like metabolism you would have for those I, periods I think... to actually register in the bone well, I mean, if you're going through severe resource loss, you'd probably show stronger ones. Like, if you need to be maintaining that, like, you know, it is possible that, like, if there's a dry season, you would show a really marked decline in your growth rate. But it, I think it's more the remodeling that would be destroying okay. them. Like, I Fair. don't think it's that they didn't deposit them, but that if you're growing that fast and you're growing that fast by constantly remodeling your bone you'll wipe out the record of your growth history. Fair, fair. I, I was I was more thinking, like, if it was, like, so constant, instead of, like, a, a speed up and slow down of, like, eating in the day, not eating at night. No, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, although I think, and I'm not sure what the status of the literature on this is, because, like, captive reptiles that are raised in, like, constant conditions still deposit growth lines. Huh, okay. Yeah, because, like, I, so, I'm, at, I'm at least only thinking about this in the terms of, Proboscideans, because that that was something that um, my alma mater did a whole bunch of stuff on. No, chat with the crew after the fact on that because it's cool stuff and it's also not pertinent to this video. So, right, I I think it has been proposed that there's some sort of inherent like circadian rhythm slowdown in your growth that happens during like part of the year because like again, if you raise a crocodile in captivity with like weekly feedings, no fluctuation in its temperature nothing that should affect its physiology, it will develop growth lines. Like, you don't just get this constant growth record, like, with no lines. So yeah. I think it is more likely that this is a feature of titanosaurs. Okay. However, it is also the case that in the Dreadnoughtus holotype, um, the scapula and coracoid are not fused to each other, which does indicate that this is a fairly young animal, probably. And so we don't really know how old it is, and we don't have the record we could use to model its growth. But we could, I think we can say from that that it could have probably gotten considerably larger. Again, I don't think it's topping out much bigger than other titanosaurs, but I think it might have been pretty similar to them at maximum size. That would be my rough guess, not really being an expert on this group. But I think we've talked about body size for too long, and we should talk about a part of their body that isn't very big or present at all. What? The head? So no head? No, the fingers. <laughs> oh, we can also certainly oh. talk about the fingers. <laughs> oh, I don't like this angle on it at all. Oh, get away uh, from You see what I mean? Yeah. No, zoom out a bit. It looks like, it looks like Hans, you know? It, it stands up, it's rectangular. <laughs> the, the hips are bigger than the shoulders. I don't want any part of this. Sorry, I've been hyper-focused on a task that is none of my business, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> um, well, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to dominate this conversation. I've talked about growth estimation for a long time now. But um, one notable feature of titanosaurs that is not shown a lot in media, and I think it's gotten wrong here on both models, right, Dalton? Yes. 
both of them um, have their kind of standard elephant feet. Right, Sad. and so not only should they not have elephant feet, because the hands of sauropod dinosaurs were, you know, they weren't modified into elephant feet. We've talked about this a lot. Dinosaur feet kind of get, like, crescent-shaped, and they're just the hands kind of planted down because they never uh, developed the ability to roll the radius over the ulna. It's so bad. So you can't put the palm on the ground. But that doesn't really matter here, because the presence of toes at all is inaccurate. Um, probably. Because this is a titanosaur, ti- we can estimate, based on the distribution of this trait, that Dreadnoughtus did not have toes at all. Titanosaurs walked on their metacarpals. Or at least front toes. Yeah. Right, right, right. I'm sorry, front toes. From the from the hands. Mm-hmm. Toes there were still toes on the feet. Quentin Tarantino's Whoa. least favorite dinosaur. Whoa. Hang on, did you speaking of feet, did you just see it scratch one leg with the other yeah. foot? That was awful. No. It like reached its it reached across and scratched the front of it. Here it's doing it again. Ugh. Oh, He's I really true. like I that. Don't think I mean I like it, but I don't think they could do that. Probably not. I was muted, so you couldn't hear me, but I just kind of screamed a little bit. <laughs> I don't like that at all. Weird. Anyway. So yes, as, as James intimated, uh, titanosaurs seem to have lost their, their fingers. They've lost the, they've lost the phalanges of the, the, the finger, and they essentially just walk on their metacarpals. Right. Um, they also reduce the carpals, too. They just kind of turn their hand into a gross pillar of bone. And the reduction, the kind of gradual reduction of the phalanges seems to happen more or less stepwise as you get like up into Macronaria, into Titanosaur formies, and then into like more uh, derived Titanosaurs. Um, so we would expect. Was, oh, sorry. Sorry. No, I was just going to say. I'm just that, looking at the phylogeny that Alex sent us from beyond. Amelia. That was. It was something that I never knew about before. It was actually the, the, the Pataga Titan at the Field Museum the first time I saw it. I had assumed this was like years ago, probably before I was in paleo at all. Um, but I remember looking at it and I was like, oh, I guess they just didn't include the toes because of the way it's mounted, it looked like maybe they just did that. So it was less for people to like break or touch because you can, I think, literally get yeah. right up next to it. So it's just like, oh, odd choice to chop off the toes, but OK. And then imagine my horror a couple years later. <laughs> it's like, no, that's just how they are. They're supposed to be missing their fingers, because why not? Ugh. Yes. Well, they were they were very haunts like in that someone was valid to eat their fingers <laughs> long ago, and they don't have them anymore. <laughs> um, some some. Man, I'm cuts. connected. That's you mentioned that meme, but that's really how I'm feeling right now. Oh, I don't Jesus know how to explain. It. I don't want to eat fingers, but I want. But you're valid too. It's valid. Too. It would be valid if I chose to do that. It's while we're discussing this, it may um, come up. So we've mentioned it, and I don't think we're going to talk too much about it. Um, let us know in the comments if you want us to talk about it more. Uh, but this animal was depicted in prehistoric planet, um, and part of that depiction involved it having kind of the enlarged thumb claw that a lot of sauropods have, and use that in ritualized combat. And we've been talking about how it doesn't have fingers, and. Um, Darren Nash has, act, has made some, several tweets about that, which explain what was going on there. And it's a completely understandable situation of why they included this. Um, because there is a titanosaur called Diamantisaurus, which is beyond having this feature, also has one of the best titanosaur skulls that we know of. Um, but it has that claw still. It's a low bar. But... Yeah. Um, it, it has that claw on the thumb. And at the time that the show was under production it was thought that Diamantisaurus was a lithostrotian. And so it was thought that, you know, the loss of that feature was either pretty complex or it took place later than we might've anticipated. Um, and so it was very reasonable to include it with uh, Dreadnoughtus. Subsequent revision of Diamantisaurus has found it to be more basal. And so it no longer seems to be the case. Um, but just to, to clarify kind of why that depiction was put in there and, and it's, it's been something that's been talked about online. So I think it's worth including here. Yeah, absolutely. Like, this is part of the thing is these documentary production timelines are really long. And part of the problem that you're dealing with in paleo is that paleontology is discovery-based science. And so new discoveries can really change what we know. When you've got the timeline of, like, building and rendering and rigging and animating a an extinct animal, 
and you have to do that at scale for a show, it's going to take long enough that the understanding of some animals will change while you're making their models. But I think that we've brought up Prehistoric Planet now. And so I think there's something else to say about its depiction of Dreadnoughtus. And Amelia, would you like to lead us into the segment? I sure can. Um, so for those of you, I don't know if any of you in our audience have, have seen this documentary. There's a documentary called Prehistoric Planet that came out, what, two years ago now? At least this season did. First season, yeah. First season, First season yeah, came out about two years ago. Two years ago. Um, yeah. And one of the things that the uh, advertisements for it highlighted was the Dreadnoughtus, uh, which they have um, in... Is it the first episode? No, second episode. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, they depict this animal uh, in a situation where it's like males are competing for mates, and they're in this big, wide-open desert kind of area. I don't remember if they ever explain why that is in the TV show. Um, uh, but- they do. They say that, they, that they're gathering there specifically just for the mating display, and then they return when it's over. Right. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so anyways, they're shown in this mating display kind of situation and in part, so there are several parts to the display and the behaviors that they show. They show the animals kind of showing off to each other, um, with brightly colored necks, I think is first. And then they start doing the balloon thing, uh, before they get into the fighting. Um, and we're going to start by talking about the balloons just a little bit. Uh, if you want us to talk more about this segment or this episode of Prehistoric Planet, please comment and let us know, and we'll give more details. Um, but for now, we're we're primarily focusing on the Jurassic World model, but um, and the animal itself. But we will talk about the balloons a little bit, in that they are certainly present um, in the narration of the TV show. Uh, Attenborough explains that these balloons come from the air sac system that was present in the necks of sauropod dinosaurs. So because sauropods are sauriscians, they have the air sac lung system like theropods do. Um, It's part of the reason that we think that they're more closely related to theropods than they were to ornithischians. So they have hollow bones, they have um, all the pneumatic anatomy, because we don't think ornithischians had this, do we? There's no evidence of pneumaticity right. in order of the skins, to which I'm aware. Yeah. Um, which also... Dense boys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, which also, like, side note, really bizarre um, and cool. Uh, but anyways, and part of the system is the, these outpouchings of air sacs that invade the skeleton and invade other parts of the body. Um, so, sauropods seem to, at least some of them, have this really elaborate air sac system in their necks. Um you guys, these guys can talk a bit more about why that might be, because I have a bold idea that I think, but I don't work on dinosaurs, so I really don't know. Uh, but the point here is that Attenborough says that these balloons that the Dreadnoughtus uh, inflate are connected to the air sac system. This is probably not what would have actually happened if these animals had these structures. So I am not saying that it's impossible for sauropods to have balloons. Um, of some kind, some kind of display boon, balloon, because it's not unknown in Sariscian dinosaurs today. There's two species of birds that I'm aware of, or at least two kinds of birds, uh, that have inflatable display structures that, at least for prairie, so it's prairie chickens and frigate birds. In prairie chickens, it's both a visual and an audio auditory display. They're making a weird sound. And in prehistoric planet, the little balloons make little popping sounds. Um, and the difference here is that in those birds, these balloon structures are not connected to their air sac system. Um, that is not the air sac coming out of the body because that is equivalent to putting your lungs outside your body. Um, and animals tend to not do that. They tend to keep their lungs protected inside their body um, because if you were to damage the lungs, you would aspirate on blood and die. Um, and then, you know, when the dreadnoughtus are shown fighting and possibly popping or lacerating these balloons, they would like die immediately. Um, Not necessarily, Uh, but they would become infected and choke on their blood and all this other horrible things. So again, not impossible for these balloons to have existed to some capacity, um, but it is very unlikely that they would have been connected to the air sac system, as in the anatomical structure uh, that is associated with the lungs. It's possible that there could have been a soft tissue uh, pouch of some kind in the existing existing. In modern birds, they're called guler pouches. So guler has to do with throat. So they're outpouchings of like skin 
around the throat. We couldn't find, we were looking before this to see if we could actually find an anatomical description of what that stuff is. But it seems to be like similar to like a frog or even like uh, the hooded seals, an outpouching of a different kind of tissue that's not directly connected to the respiratory system in the same way that an air sac would be in a bird. So Amelia, like Amelia mentioned, we're not able to we were not able to find any anatomical descriptions of these gular pouches and in birds that use them for display, um, which are, I know of one more. So Amelia mentioned prairie chickens and frigate birds. I know also greater sage grouse also seem to do it. I was thinking that's why I, I thought that, aren't they related? The yeah, I mean, they're both, the um, thing? They're but both they're, game But birds. they are separate species. Yeah, 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 I knew, yeah. yeah. I knew there was another species. I didn't know if it was another prairie chicken thing or if it was, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I do think there are some other species. It might not only be greater prairie chicken. I think lesser also do it. But I mean, this is neither here nor there. It yeah. pops up in, Clay. like, it pops up in grouse and, you know, the chicken group of birds and yeah. it's popping up. So it's popping up in game birds. It's popping up in some, um, like, frigate birds. Um. I have no idea what's actually going on anatomically there, but the fact is that, like, Amelia is right. It's not an air sac. Right? Because an air sac means something. Like, this is the thing, and I think it, this is lost in a lot of discussions of jargon in science. Like, we use jargon because we have to be specific about what we're talking about. This is, like, why lawyers use it. Like, you know, like, it's not to exclude people from conversations. And I think scientists often get very hung up on jargon and terminology, but that's because what you call something is actually like a descriptor of what it is. And it helps us keep track of what we're talking about. So it, it's important that we all know what we're talking about. And what Amelia is saying, when she means an air sac, which is the normal usage of the term in our community is like, it's an out pocketing of the pulmonary tissues or, the, I mean, they're not gas exchanging, but, like, these are, like, respiratory epithelial diverticuli. If Alex were here, he could provide a more thorough description of the um, well, I'd be actual tissue source, I'm sorry. Not, not to but, actually inter interject, but thinking about embryos really quick, quickly, I bet that they would have separate origins from, like, the germ layers, right? Because if it's a, if it's a skin pouch, it's going to be coming from the ectoderm versus, like, lung tissue is endoderm. Yeah, but so is trachea, right? And and I think what it's actually like it's wrapped in it's gonna be wrapped in skin, so there's obviously ectodermal contribution, but like Well right, but I'm just I saying it, Okay. If it well is it I think the it's, trachea itself? I, I think it's probably an outpocketing of the yeah, tracheal tissues. Ooh, don't like that. Bad. Right. It, it must be that there's some sort of like, you know, little diverticulum of the trachea. Because one thing that these birds do that they don't really depict in prehistoric planet either is that they, they have to pump air into those sacs, and it takes a long time. I think for frigate birds, it takes like 20 minutes to blow it up. So this isn't like you're just inhaling and air is flowing in and filling up this, this air sac. Like, the male frigate birds will work for a long time to inflate their display structure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that's just another thing. It's also debated how active these like postcranial air sacs are even in respiration. I think there's a lot of evidence that many of the ones in the bones, at least, are just dead air. So it's that the the respiratory system's like invading the bone, but that that's actually not used in respiration. Birds have air sacs that are just within the abdominal cavity as well, and those are actively ventilated. Um, but I don't think anybody's ever managed to just measure like, do you get airflow in this little sac that's in the vertebrae? I imagine it would be a very difficult thing to measure in the real animal. Um, in any in any case, like it's it's just like. What Amelia is saying is like these are not air sacs developmentally. Like an air sac is a particular kind of thing. It may be a sac that's filled with air, but that doesn't make it an air sac. Um, and, and I and that's an important thing to to keep in mind. Um, I don't think it's impossible that sauropods had gular display structures, but I don't think they would really work the way they did in prehistoric planet. I do know that like for a lot of these speculative things that producers of Prehistoric Planet did work on like justifications and behind the scenes stuff about how it worked. And my understanding is some of it may actually be published. And so I think that's why we haven't seen more of it yet. And so when I see more of the justification behind it, I'm more than willing to change my tune. Um, but for right now, we don't really know what the like hypothesized inner workings of it are. But we can just say, I based on our knowledge. Right, I agree with Amelia. I don't think it's particularly likely that air sacs would have been used like that. Mm -hmm. 
so now I think we've talked about everything interesting anatomically there is to say about dread models. <laughs> More or less. And now we should share why one of these models that's on screen right now is an abominable war crime. And one of them is it's like okay. Canadian. <laughs> Well, let's start. <laughs> let's start at the top and work our way down, and let's look at some heads. Uh... Now, I know I mentioned. You know what this is, what? Tom? I'm sorry. This is the old Yale Brontosaurus. It is. No, it's it's haunts coded. It's absolutely Yale Brontosaurus coded. And I don't know why. But, okay, I'm I'm going to do my incredibly lukewarm defense of the head of this dreadnoughtus. I don't hate it if you interpret the big nose as entirely soft tissue. We know that sauropods had some sort of soft tissue um, systems on the face for the nostrils, because they have the nostrils up on the top of the head. We know that they weren't there. There's evidence on the, on the skull. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility for the macronarian to have a bigger nose. Um, like, sure, it does cover up a lot of the skull. And if anything, I don't think it looks that different. It is a bit more bulbous, a bit more rotund, but it doesn't look that different from the prehistoric planet Alamosaurus. With the one key difference being uh, this thing has cheeks, and I really hate that it has cheeks. And it, it look he does look like he's doing a little Richard Nixon. He's like, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it looks like Richard Nixon, Dick Cheney, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I don't hate the I don't hate the big nose. Um, it doesn't have a skull. How can you defend this? True, yeah. Uh, we actually don't know what any sauropod skulls look like, let alone any titanosaur skulls, so might as well just put a regular horse skull on it. Of course we have skulls of other animals, and it could of look entirely one, different. This is I'm true. being pedantic. Um, and yeah. I want to return to a point I made in a prior video. I forget which one. I think it was Deinonychus. If you're, it's okay to do speculative stuff but make it look good this is an example <laughs> i don't of think this I looks know. bad minus the cheeks scott scott and i mean this with love <laughs> but you need to shut the f- up about this design because you are incorrect about it <laughs> it's it's rough it looks this, like- this is where i'm going to earn my kindness score and on the chart <laughs> that we have i have a a scientific thought regarding this which is this does seem to be an interesting case in which like the Jurassic world designers used a more scientifically approached, like a more scientifically based approach than a frontier design. doesn't happen that often. Um, happens more for dominion than for other things. Cause like, dominion had actual good paleontological oversight. And I think more care was put into it. Um, but so we don't have a skull for uh, Dreadnoughtus. Um, and, you may, and we don't have a skull for Patagotitan, but you may have seen, if you've seen the mounts, that it has a skull. And that skull is based predominantly off of Sarmientosaurus. And we also have a skull from Diamantosaurus, as I said before. And in both cases, they're, they're different from one another. They're different animals. Um, but it, it seems to be at least somewhat of a trend that Titanosaurus kind of have like a tall back of the head around the eyes and then a pretty low front of the head that comes down and their skull is kind of long up until the back so like kind of like a j if you turn it on its side a little bit um and so i think the jurassic world one actually does a decent job of, of that shape of like here's the tall back of the head and then the schnoz comes out quite a ways and that seems to be a, a very broad strokes pattern within titanosaurs at least derived ones yeah and that's i think part of what's bugging me is like, I'm thinking of Patagotitan because that's, even though it's not, it doesn't have a skull, the skull that they put on that skeleton that I've seen a thousand times because it's right in the AMNH, that little door or that little room is right next to where you go upstairs to go to the Gilder school. Um, and it's the fact that like, I don't think the nostrils are even really in the right place. A B like that's, the, the humpy thing that's happening there is part above part of the snout that does not have the the macronarian like bump to it like it just doesn't make sense to get it like it looks like the horrible brontosaurus it, no. 
No, it would be in the part of the skull that would have a soft tissue bit to it. <laughs> it's the little. It's the little. N- in the pouty, yeah. He looks like a carp. He looks like Richard Nixon. It looks. I, I figured out what it looks like. It looks like <clears throat> the. Um, it looks in a bad way because I think these these book covers look good as they are for what they are. They, it looks like the Aragon. Oh yeah, dragon style. It does. And which it does. for those animals, it's a very specific style. Those are characters, and like it's different because it's also that artist and his style. But it doesn't work on this thing because it's not a fantasy dragon animal that also has cool other things to it and nice colors it is on I, one of these earlier i'm not going to say which one it was i was having a visceral reaction to one of these earlier and i realized it was because it was the same color as the cadaver i worked on this summer in anatomy class and i was not happy about that at all because of this palette lo- you, you worked on a, a freshly dead titanosaur that's insane I did. no 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 i'm um, amazed you could fit into the lab it anyway. looks vaguely penile yeah i don't like I that like it. I, I don't <laughs> what i do like more it also it also like it gives everything but a sauropod to me it gives king of the hill character it gives richard nixon it gives carp carp it gives oh it gives God. penile <laughs> and it gives like lit up turn a little bit like this reminds me of a stupid looking macrocania oops um it looks like it's an aunt who's very disappointed in you <laughs> for something you said at the Christmas dinner table. You see? You, it, you see what I mean? It looks like a worse version of the Disney dinosaur Aladar thing. Yeah. Yes. Like, it looks like that, but bad. Because, again, those are characters and they're stylized and they do, like, look like characters and they look nice for what they are, in my opinion. This does not. This is just a bully stick like i don't like it <laughs> i think what looks better is the movie version from yeah. uh dominion yeah. um but i will I, and i must share here the uh, what i think was the single funniest line in jurassic world dominion was at them flying alan grant and Ver- and i think it was sattler it was only the two of them i think being transported into the biosyn facility on a plane and alan grant looks out the window and he says in like the tired tone of voice that only an older actor who's been forcibly brought back to a franchise they don't wish to return to can ever utter like no other person can sound this exhausted it's the same tone of voice that like i'm not that he's old but that uh, oscar isaac has in the uh the rise of skywalker when he says somehow palpatine has returned <laughs> or like it, harrison just, ford gives to almost every line in the uh in T- kingdom of the crystal skull Right, or in uh, a movie I watched last night, actually, uh, Dial of Destiny, where, where you know, where he says you didn't account for continental drift. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful phrase. I'm going to talk I, anyway, about that afterwards. Can, I still haven't seen. That. We'll talk about that afterward. But you can only sound that tired when you're an actor being brought back to a franchise you didn't really want to go back to, but they paid you a lot of money to do it. And Sam Neill, as Doctor Grant says, is that Dreadnoughtus? And I just, and he sounds a little excited, but he can't really fake the excitement well enough. And I absolutely lost my shit at the idea of any paleontologist seeing a living sauropod where we know them from like very little material overall and him immediately pinpointing the exact genus it was. (laughs) I don't care if there's an in-universe explanation. I think it's funny. I know. Well, you're saying that because we fought about this before recording. Not fought, but like... Obviously, right. in this world, he's probably seen a photograph slash video of one. And there's only like three sauropods that I'm aware of that have been brought back. And if it's not, it's not a Brachiosaurus. It's bigger than a Patasaurus. So it must be the other one. And I, and I think that's fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I still do find I, I have not laughed that hard in a long time. And I it caught me completely by surprise. <laughs> I loved it. It was the same way I laughed after the um, the trailer for that horror movie, Smile, the first oh, time yeah. I saw that. Okay. When I, I just started yeah. guffawing in the theater yeah. at the idea that I was supposed to find yeah, that, that scary. That movie was better than I thought it was going to be. It was actually pretty good. I've heard that as well. It's I've, I've heard amazing, yeah, I've heard, I've heard amazing that too. monster I've heard at the end of it. relatively solid. <laughs> yeah, it's got a great monster, and otherwise it's, it's, it's not bad. Um... 
a thing I want to bring up about these different designs. They're very different postures, very different body yes. constructions. The Dominion one is very clearly based off of the skeletal diagram from the description of that Dreadnoughtus. And like, I don't know why Frontier didn't base theirs off of that. Like they've reconstructed it you know, like a Brachiosaurus and we know the proportions of its limbs and they aren't this. I was just going to say to be charitable, if they're like, oh, it's related to Brachiosaurus, we will just rig it on that without putting that much thought into it. But it's bad. It looks like haunts. To be, yeah. again, a defender of this, there are skeletal reconstructions that depict it in more, much more of an upright posture than that one. I, I'm i fine with a more upright oh, posture, more but just the, yeah, difference, the difference length of the arm and the leg. Like, Dreadnoughtus seems to have arms and legs that are more or less the same length. You see the, 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 the joints are at the same level, though, and like this one, clearly, like the knee is below the elbow. Yes. Look yes. At it. Oh my god, that's disgusting. Hang what on, is it looking doing? From the front. I, it's stanced up. I do love its stance. <laughs> it looks, it's a good yeah. stance. I, it looks like those old, like, <laughs> sprawling uh, upright diagrams to explain, well, like, it's, posture. It's doing, it's doing the giraffe thing. Yeah. Of when no, they drop. I don't when think they that's... Just, Arms yeah, out. but the model's bad enough that it still looks bad. Um, I, I will say that, like my my bigger complaint with the, my bigger complaint with the frontier one is I hate how thin the neck is. Yeah, like if if there's anything we know about like titanosaurs from their like cervical vertebrae is that these guys had really big ass necks. Yeah, I would. If you'll indulge me, may I make a very brief uh, discussion about the stance? Because I, I do think sure. they might be trying to achieve something with the old design, which is that there are the ideas of kind of wide and narrow gauge sauropods. Um, and this is a thought that comes from sauropod trackways, which in like multi-specific or at least presumably multi-specific trackways of sauropods, you'll often see tracks that are pretty close to each other and tracks that are kind of far away from each other. And, and those have been thought of as wide and narrow gauge trackways. And the idea is that they're produced by different species of sauropods whose limbs are kind of constructed in different ways. Um, and a lot of titanosaurs, especially by virtue of their size and the orientation of their limbs, they're thought to be mostly kind of wide gauge and that their stance is, is pretty wide. And that makes sense that they're supporting a tremendous amount of weight. Um, and so I don't think it's unreasonable for them to kind of stance it up like this. I also don't think this is particularly unreasonable. And I don't know that we have, I mean, we probably do have good enough knowledge that if someone was to, actually cast a dreadnoughtus and reconstruct it we could get a good idea of what it looks like um but the reason i bring up the track the, the trackways and the gauges is because there was an svp talk in australia and i had to make sure that this had been published and it has been published um by christian a meyer and colleagues uh looking at a titanosaur trackway from bolivia and it's an amazing trackway it's on this cliff face so it's rotated 90 degrees and the face of the cliff is just a huge highway of dinosaur tracks it's an incredible site and there's tons of tracks going across it. And in this paper, they describe looking at, you can see singular trackways where you're following one track maker going along a path, which go from narrow gauge to wide gauge and back to narrow gauge. And so while I, I do think that there is validity in using the gauge of trackways to, to potentially diagnose different ichno species and be like, Hey, these are different animals. It does look like some of that may just be related to, the behavior the animal was doing and that certain sauropods at least were capable of producing both wide and narrow tracks. Potentially if they needed more traction to get out of a stickier substrate, they might've adopted a wider posture or if they were walking slowly, they might've been more wide. And as they sped up kind of got things into a narrower position. So I just think that's a very interesting thing that we'll probably never have the opportunity to bring up again in one of these Jurassic videos. And so there it is. So they did, in fact, have the capability of stancing up. Yes. At will. And they could stance down. <laughs> yeah. It's no stance, really... if you will. <laughs> I'd like that they could switch into high gear when they yeah. <laughs> It's the <laughs> plankton, not when I switch into <laughs> maximum <laughs> overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> hi <-yah! laughs> Anyway, should we rank this guy? Yeah, I want to be done with it. Absolutely. I want to be done with that one in particular. <clears throat> All right, let's rank it. Let's save this. 
Ooh, a fun little thing to bring up while we're getting into the species viewer is I found it really interesting that in my research, getting ready for this video, that um, Dreadnoughtus actually uh, shares its environment with another of the absolute most gigantic titanosaurs that we know yeah. of. That um, the the formation it's found in, the Cerro Fortaleza formation, forgive my pronunciation if that was wrong, um, is also home to Puertosaurus, which is huh. huge. It, it's it, There aren't that many dinosaurs there, but it, it's a weird bunch. It's Dreadnoughtus, Puertosaurus, um, Orcoraptor, um, the Megaraptor, and mm -hmm. then a weird little... Oh god, what what is this thing? Uh Averostrin, um uh Ostrochiris and uh hmm. that's and oh, oh and a Northern at the pod. Yeah. Of course. It's, uh, it's a cool place in my research for it to reconstruct the habitat. Um just to justify what you all were looking at now that we're not looking at it anymore. Uh Dreadnoughtus was found <laughs> in a crevasse. Dreadnoughtus was found in a crevasse display, so I made one of those in the environment. That's where a river breaks a natural levee and creates like a little kind of small delta a little bit. Um, so there's one of those. Uh, and it's interesting in that contrary to environments that are studied in Antarctica, which are of the same age or roughly the same age, the Antarctic environments seem to be dominated by angiosperms. And this one seems to be dominated by gymnosperms. Um, hmm. It's like a reverse ratio of like 75, 25%. Now granted preservational biases and taphonomy take it with a grain of salt, but it's an interesting, uh, interesting environmental observation. And I mean, I would believe it with things like the pollen and plant fossil record that like there, there's enough stuff that you're probably getting a more robust signal than I think you would with vertebrate fossils, for instance. Mm -hmm. Although I think this is mostly based off of the woody fossil record. So, Oh, I see. Well, in that case, yeah, it could be um, pretty but... biased. Um, now are we ranking these animals yes. separately or is this we just going to be Yes. Okay. Well, in that case, Amelia, you should start us off. Good lord. I hate it. The only thing I like about this one is that some of the color patterns have like little stockings of dark color, which I, I like as an aesthetic choice. Um, I don't like this one. It looks like it was left out in the sun too long. <laughs> Mm, and uh, good lord I'm torn I don't think it's bad enough for, for F tier but I just hate it so much I, I've, I've had too many unpleasant reactions to it I have to give it an F it's just Ooh. I don't like it it doesn't look right it doesn't look like a titanosaur from afar I would be like oh that's a weird brachiosaur and then you zoom in and it's like oh no it's bad um the legs are wrong like the, the proportions are wrong i don't like you can like see the fingers on the feet and normally i don't give a shit about the feet but like i can tell on this one that they're not right from a distance which i don't like um the colors are mostly terrible like there are there was like one that was okay it was like it was i think it was like kind of an olive green with the little dark mittens and like that looked okay it was yeah it was one of the green ones and then had like little stockings um or maybe it was just shadows. I don't know. It looked fine, you know? But anyways, I, it doesn't matter because there was a cadaver colored one. It looked like a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. I hate it. I'm sorry. I'll stop now. I just can't. I can't. Can't deal with it. I think... <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I'm going to go with a D tier. I don't like it, but I don't like it in an in a way where I find its existence insulting to me, um, which is where that's my barometer for F tier. Um, it's just, I, I think it's pretty, I think it's unfortunately ugly given that this is a cool animal. I never used this in the original Jurassic World game. And now if I have to use it in some capacity, I always use the movie version. If I had to use this one, I basically never look at it closely and just ignore that it's there. So, um, I'm going with D tier. It's it's pretty bad. The only redeeming quality is the foghorn sound effects. Like I I love that, and I wish that 
that were more common or that kind of vibe were more common, but it's not enough to save it. I like it. I don't like it like a lot. I have quibbles with it, obviously. Like, I wish it didn't have cheeks. Um, I wish the neck was a whole lot thicker. I wish that it wasn't as, like, upward slanted as Brachiosaurus is. Um, and I wish that it didn't have toes. But other than that, I like it. I It has my favorite sauropod... Some of my favorite sauropod noises period like that i i know that um like it only does it rarely in the um evolution 2 release animation but in the evolution 1 it release animation when it does do that foghorn noise it is the first time i've heard a sauropod like make a sound that feels like even th through the le layers of disambiguation of like playing a video game and stuff it feels like if you were standing next to it, it would like vibrate every molecule of your being of just being around this thing. And I love that. I think it's neat and I don't hate it. And I'm giving it a B. A B. A Sorry. B. Okay. Scott, you will not be spared in the revolution. Try me. <laughs> Well, I believe Alex sent in his ranking. He gave it a D for Dreadnoughtus. <laughs> yep. And you know what I'm going to give it? Is D for Dreadnoughtus. I, and D for don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> for all of the above reasons. And I'm not going to uh, lengthen the recording any longer than I need to. D. Can we see the good one? Hello. Next. Now, I almost think I like the movie colors the best. I I do too. Kind of do too. Let's just go with it. It's so much better in every way. Like, yeah, I still don't love it, but I think that's a personal bias against sauropods. I'll give it an A because I feel like they could have done something more with it to make it a little bit cooler. But it is good. I do... The other thing I'll say in retrospect about the other one that I did like was the, the exit hatchery animation where it's like there's a hot minute before you see the animal at all because it's so tall. Mm -hmm. um, they could have done that with so this one as well. They, they actually but... do. I, I will tell you. That. Oh. It, it, it seems to like have two different animations that it'll swap between. And I guess it okay. does... I thought it might be species specific because I tested it yesterday, but I think it just is random. Yeah. Okay, never mind then. Um... Screw the other one, it sucks. I'll give this one a nice A. Because like I said, this, I feel like it's missing something. I don't know what, um, but I don't like it as much as I potentially could. This one for me is a solid B. Um, I don't dislike it. I don't particularly like it. There's something about the rectangularness of the feet that um, I just don't... To misquote Christopher Moltisanti on The Sopranos... It's like the rectangularness of its feet is too much for me or something. Everybody who watches our channel should have to watch The Sopranos, and eventually there will be complete continuity lockout. You will not understand what we're talking about unless you've seen all six seasons. Um, it, it's pretty good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with a B. I don't think it's as good as what I've put in A tier, but I don't think it's a bad design per se. I'll very much echo what you're going for there, James, that like its feet look very toy like. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it looks very much like this is a design that was first and foremost intended to, hey, when we make this into an action figure, it needs to stand up nicely. Um, especially also uh, something that really does bug me on this thing and uh, it, it, its tail's way too long. Like, we have the tail of oh, Dreadnoughtus, yeah, well, and it's half the size of that. That's a good point. Like, it's, like, I'll put it this way. If this was the Diplodocus design, I'd like it a whole lot more. 
But as a dreadnoughtess, I don't super enjoy that. Basically, both of the like the two designs, I don't like a lot of aspects about them to similar degrees of like the body shape and a lot of the proportions and everything are way better in this. I like the um, I like the posture a bit better in this and everything. But there are so many things that I really, really dislike about this. Rather than with the other one, there are things I like, but then a lot of things that they don't do as well. It's more like one starting from the bottom and one starting from the top, and they're both meeting at a B. This one's also a B. Um. <laughs> I the tail the tail thing is interesting. Hmm. Anyway, Alex said something about this one. He sure did. Was it B for bread? I notice? don't remember. I'm scrolling. It was B. Yeah, he gave it B. B for bread. B for bread. And I'm, you know what? I'm having a real original <laughs> thought here, folks. I'm not beating the uh, the sheeple allegations. It's a B for me as well. Um, I like I, I like the, the the apparent care that went into designing the skull and the head. Um, mm-hmm. Which is funny because we don't have one for Dreadnoughtus, but you know there was some thought behind that at least. The neck I like. Um, yeah, I echo. I think the limbs are weird. They're like they just like I don't know for li- sauropod limb myology at all, but they look muscled wrong and like lumpy. Um, and speaking to the toy, this thing's not beating the toy allegations. Um, there's like a weird shift in the texture in the midline, which makes me think of like there's a really cool big dreadnoughtus toy that as a kid I would have loved to have. It's enormous. And I think when you assemble it out of the box, like I think it's shipped because it's so big, it's shipped in pieces. And I think it comes in like halves and they join together. And I can only see this weird like seam in the animal as like, Oh, that's where the toy gets assembled. Um, oh, it's God. weird. And like, I don't hate it. It's just, it, it just kind of doesn't fit. It, there's, there's an oddness. Amelia was absolutely right. There's an oddness to it, but it's not bad. It's a beat. You know what it is about the forearms, or at least one thing, the biceps is extending over the shoulder joint because mm. it's that like lump that should be the mm. biceps brachii is extending like way up into like it's going like well onto the belly of the muscles going well onto what should be the coracoid. Hmm. I think that's part of it. Like it doesn't have a shoulder, right? It's got like a big muscular arm that's going directly into the body. There's other things too, but I, that's what I notice right now. Alright. Yeah, but I guess we can rank it. So with that, I guess um, the Frontier Dreadnoughtus, does that go in... I guess that goes to D, I would, I would probably say. Well, we had an F, a B, and three Ds. I think that's an a F, D. A B, and three Ds. Yeah, that's a D. either a C or a D. I've, right. It's a 1.6 on the... Th- or 1.2 average so i think ah, it's that's a d. a d yeah all right so frontier dreadnoughtus against my better judgment get to d <laughs> and dominion uh dominion dreadnoughtus gets a b there she goes all righty okay and is it time to spin the wheel question mark Kind of. It's time, time in the past. It's time in the past to spin the wheel <laughs> now. Spin. Spin. spin that, that, that. That. Wheel. Wheel. Round and round it goes. Where will it land? Oh. Oh my god. Oh. oh. No. <laughs> Let's we go. got Tylosaurus. Tylosaurus. It's my that turn to say bad. you're gonna have to cut this a thousand times because I just spent a week looking at Tylosaurus that I can't talk about. <laughs> Thank God. Oh, I'm so happy. Great, this is great. <laughs> this was certainly not supposed to be this episode, which was then ruined by Alex being stuck in Puerto Rico. <laughs> but well, it's that possibly fault, have happened. To be clear. <laughs> Um, but that means it's Alex's fault that we are having episode 50 be very memorable. Yes, indeed. Yes. I hope so. It better be. I'll um, try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, so tune in next week for uh, us to talk about Tylosaurus, which will be us. the first Mosasaur that we do in this series. Not the first Mosasaur we've talked about on, at length on the channel, because we talked about Yorgi when it was when Amelia published it a couple of months ago, quite a bit, um, in a stream. That was very fun. Next time we stream, you should come to it. Um, but before we close out, I want to briefly take this opportunity to thank our patrons. We've had a, a wonderful increase in our Patreon ranks in the last week. I guess people are feeling very generous for the holidays. People must have asked for the skeleton crew for Christmas, <laughs> and they received. And, yes. Oh, they've received. All right. Um, so oh, they have. This is, oh. We have received. <laughs> and so have they. So we want to thank our uh, our patrons because the support that you guys give us is really going a long way to making these videos possible and helping us take the time we need to take to run this channel and make sure that our videos are good and informative and that we can put all the effort we want to into them. And so all of our patrons will have their names uh, displayed on screen right now, scrolling in the credits of this video. Um, but... Some of our patrons support us at our Gorgosaurus tier or higher. And so for you guys, we want to give you a special spoken shout out as a token of our appreciation. And as of this recording, uh, those special patrons are Benjamin Siepser, nickname 3110, Philip Fico, AK92, Christopher Bellis Jones, Adam Olos, Dan O'Kyrus, King Zashu, Max Ironpaw, Original Username, Pythonic, Swamp Ape Science, and Wheat. Thank you guys all so much for your support of the Skeleton Crew, uh, and we encourage anybody still watching at this point in the video, if you haven't yet, and you're able to, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Every little bit of support we get goes a long way to helping these videos come out uh, consistently and at good quality, um, and helps us a lot as we try to spool up into the next phase of our channel and diversify our content a little bit. Uh, stay tuned here. This is our first video of 2024, and we are really excited for everything that we're going to be bringing to you guys soon. So thank you again for your support. Please remember to like this video, comment on it, and subscribe to The Skeleton Crew if you haven't already. And we will see you next week for our 50th episode in this series where we talk about uh, a very, very special Mosasaur, Tylosaurus. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.